I'm going to get us started, please, if I could have your attention. Welcome, everyone, to the annual George Gerbner Lecture in Communication. It's my pleasure to say a little bit about um, George Gerbner and then introduce our introducer of today's speaker. George Gerbner's personal history is a remarkable one. He was born in 1919 in Budapest, Hungary, fleeing to Paris in 1939 to avoid conscription in the Hungarian military, then under the control of the right-wing Hungarian government allied with Nazi Germany. He eventually made his way to the United States by way of first Mexico and then Cuba. In the United States, he earned his bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley in 1942, working briefly thereafter for the San Francisco Chronicle as a writer, columnist, and assistant editor. He joined the U.S. Army in 1943, eventually working for the Office of Strategic Command. In January 1945, he parachuted into occupied territory along the Austrian-Slovenian border and operated behind enemy lines with resistance forces until the end of the war in Europe. After Germany's defeat, he was sent to Austria to investigate a mass encampment of Hungarian soldiers, among which was Hungary's pro-Nazi prime minister, whom Gerbner helped arrest and return to Budapest to be later tried and eventually executed in a war, uh, as a war criminal. Gerbner returned to Los Angeles and volunteered as a newspaper editor for the Independent Progressive Party. Gerbner's leftist activism during the height of Senator Joseph McCarthy's anti-communist crusade attracted the interest of the California House Un-American Committee, before which he was called to testify. Shortly thereafter, he was hired to teach journalism at John Muir College, now Pasadena City College. To gain teaching credentials, he began graduate coursework at the University of Southern California's School of Education. He stayed to complete a master's degree in June 1951 with a thesis titled Television and Education and a PhD in the school's audiovisual department with a dissertation titled Toward a General Theory of Communication. Recalling his decision to study communication at a time when the field hardly existed, Gerbner explained in a 1992 interview, quote, I came to the conclusion that communication is really where the action is, the political action, the social action, the cultural action. In 1956, Gerbner joined the faculty of the Institute of Communication Research at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where he remained for eight years. In 1964, Gerbner left Illinois for the University of Pennsylvania, where he was hired to serve as Dean of the Annenberg School of Communication only five years after it was founded here at Penn. Gerbner proceeded to build a world-class research and teaching faculty, and under his tenure, it became a national leader in communication research and in the developing and then still fledgling field of communication and turning it into a serious and scholarly discipline. Under his leadership, the school published the leading journal in the field, the Journal of Communication, for which he served as editor, created the first World Encyclopedia of Communication, and established the Washington Program, a communications project that brought communication researchers and practitioners together in the policymaking capital of Washington, D.C. Gerbner was also responsible for the still influential theory of media effects, known as cultivation analysis, through his decades-long Cultural Indicators Research Project, which documented trends in television content and how consuming this mediated representation of the world affected viewers' perceptions and behaviors. Dr. Gerbner retired from the deanship in 1989, in 1989 after 25 years as dean of the Annenberg School, the university still the university's longest-serving uh, dean. He continued to teach and do research, first at Penn and later at Temple University, and he passed away in December of 2005. The lecture series of which today's talk is a part was established at the time of his stepping down as dean to honor his many accomplishments. With only two exceptions since that time, the annual George Gerbner Lecture has been given by an Annenberg School alumnus who has gone on to contribute to the study and or practice of communication. Today we add the name of another such alum. The pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker has become our uh, tradition, goes to his former advisor, Professor Robert Hornick, the Wilbur Schramm Professor of Communication. Please join me in welcoming Professor Hornick, who will introduce today's speaker.
Thanks, uh, and I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Itzik, uh, who was a wonderful student while he was here. He came to us with a BA and MA from the University of Haifa um, and uh, finished his PhD in 2000, barely yesterday. Um, um, so uh, Itzik has carved out an area for himself uh, that's uh, quite central to the field, in my view. His doctoral search about media influence argued that it was a mistake to look only for individual influence, so direct effects of media, or only for institutional influence, or only for individual persuasion, but not for social norm change. He suggested that the process of media influence is likely to work through multiple paths, and if all we do is look in one of those places, uh, the larger picture is likely to be lost. He took on for his dissertation, um, uh, project that I'm comfortable with. Uh, he took on for his dissertation the problem of uh, driving while intoxicated, a behavior that had declined quite sharply over the previous decade or decade and a half before he began studying it. Um, he argued that media had been influential in that process. He made the case that they'd been influential uh, substantially because the media agenda um, affected the policy agenda and produced associated legislation. And those policy changes affected individual behavior. The effects were not largely through individual influence, but through policy changes. Though he also looked for evidence about um, the effect, effects on social discussion, he looked for evidence around the issue of individual behavior, uh, um, direct change. Certainly none of those individual hypotheses were unknown at the time he was studying them. But what Itzik did, and this was really the unique contribution, was work at multiple levels of analysis with media content data, with archived public records about drunk driving and legislation, and with secondary analysis of available data, uh, survey data, uh, that he could get access to. He looked at both aggregate effects and individual effects, bringing to bear all the appropriate analytic approaches. Um, so this was a very important contribution. Since his leaving here in 2000, he's been at Rutgers, uh, now an associate, a tenured associate professor there in the Department of Communication. In the more than 20 chapters and books that he's written, uh, he's published since that time, he's continued to work both on issues of substance abuse uh, and particularly alcohol, and continues to focus his conceptual work on the role of social norms and on institutional responses to media coverage. He's also developed something of a side job, so all those reviews you get from journals, and you wonder, who's writing all this stuff? That's Itzik, because uh, he's developed a side role of writing a, a lot about methodology, particularly propensity scoring and, and uh, time series analysis, uh, uh, and also being a very major contributor to the review process, both uh, for grants and for, uh, uh, for, for journal articles. He, I know he contributes to that a lot. So I'm really very much looking forward to his presentation this afternoon. In many ways, an opportunity for Itzik to summarize an essential uh, path that he's gone down, an essential part of his research tra trajectory, as you notice up there, rules to live by on the value of studying social norms from a communication perspective. Itzik? And thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody, for, for having me. It's a great honor. And, and as Bob said, um, um, I. When I finished my dissertation, it was an unfinished business. I was not very happy with the way I tested the known path in my dissertation. So it took me only 10 years, okay, but now, and I'm not done yet, okay, but I'm back here and to tell you what I found out about social norms and why I think it's crucial that more of us will study social norms and, and uh, what can we possibly contribute then to this whole discussion between disciplines on a, a construct that's really important. Okay? Social norms are a very important construct in many disciplines, and I think we need to make, start making this links and communication as a potential to contribute to that, and, and that's my kind of personal jo journey as I speak. Now, I'm, I'm happy to see that everybody has drink, because a lot of the presentation is going to be about alcohol and anti-alcohol, <laughs> and so you may want to finish your drinks earlier, but just, just to give you the heads up. It, I think it's particularly suitable to, to make this presentation, because George Gerbner walk has a lot to do with a lot of the ways, as Bob presented, frame my way of thinking about communication. Okay? And, and you can see from this quote, and by the way, it's, it's right there on the archive, the Annabelle School archive of his work, which I think is fantastic. And it's, it's always good to go back and read and find these quotes. But 
uh, as he said, no study of behavior society, let alone communications, can be fruitful in isolation from the context, okay, I'm emphasizing the word context, of civil systems that define what exists, okay, and maybe later I'm going to call it something like descriptive norm, okay, what is important, okay, I'm going to call it maybe injunctive norm, okay, and what is right, and the stories that illuminate how things work, what things are, and what to do about them, okay. My presentation today is about this, about the context, the importance of looking, going beyond individual cognitions and looking at the social relationships we have and the amount of influence they have in our life. And we're trying to really understand how communication can be pivotal there, but really beginning to understand what social norms are because we don't have enough information about that. The other piece I want to emphasize here, which will be crucial towards the end of the presentation, is about telling stories. I think telling stories is the way to go. That's the way to influence and get what we want to get done, both on the in political communication setting, health communication, and so forth. We need to pay more attention to telling stories, and norms are part of the stories. Okay? And I want to talk to you about that, and maybe you can get some sort of examples. So that's really the, the, the background for, for the work uh, that I do. And those are questions I, I started with, and, and I think what's important to me is that we both talk about cross-level theorizing. Is it's important to me to understand how people experience things in everyday life. Okay, so we talk about a lot about macro level phenomena. We talk about things like social capital. Okay, but we have no idea how people experience in everyday life. So if I want to intervene, if I'm coming from an applied science perspective, I really want to understand how people experience these. I need to ask the questions. How do people experience social norms in everyday life? Okay, up to that point, again, my dissertation talked about aggregates. We look at norms as something that influences people, universally influences in a certain way, but we didn't really think about how does it influence people. How do people experience them in everyday life? Okay? And that's important connections to make when you move from macro level phenomena. Things like policy. How do people experience policy? Okay? And so that was my first motivation, try to answer that question. And of course, the second question, follow up question was how does communication shape this experience? Because so now I, once I understand what the experience is, what is the role of communication in this? What can I learn about communication? What can communication teach us about social norms? And I think that's an important piece uh, to start with. Now, it's not that we uh, entirely new to this issue of norms. Uh, pretty much everybody sitting in this, in this room study norms in one form or another. Because norms are everywhere. They're very influential, okay? They guide our behavior. Every single thing we do is probably has a norm attached to it. And so people who are studying norms in political communication setting, okay? We talked about no such as what to talk about. Okay? We talked about things like spiral silence. You know, what are you supposed to talk or not talk about in political discussions? Okay? We have norms guiding behavior and health communication in that arena as well. Okay? So norms are prevalent. Norms are there. It's part of our life. So it just deserves more attention. What I want to point out is that we spend a lot of time on attitudes. We, we spend a lot of time on understanding attitudes. A lot of research involves attitudes. So we nailed it down. But I think we left another construct a, a not a well explicated. I think that's a piece, the first piece I encounter. So I go out and I try to figure out how people experience social norms, but the various questions are what social norms? What exactly are social norms? Okay? And I thought to myself, what a great topic for a course. So I offered a course, a graduate level course called Communication Normative Influence. And lo and behold, people registered to take this course, okay? <laughs> which was shocking because there was no syllabus. Okay? The course was about trying to figure together how to explicate a construct. So, so the, the hidden agenda was to work with graduate students understanding how you start with a construct, you explicate that, you explain what it is, and you start thinking about how you operationalize it. So taking them to the whole perspective of a researcher when they approach something new. And of course it was more fun for me because we, I learned something new as a process. So the very first thing they've done, which I asked them to do, is go find the definition of social norms. So they searched Google and they collected, I think it was about 50 different definitions of social norms. And they want to see if we can find anything in common. And so we put it in one of these Wordle things. Okay, so you can see it visually, okay? And, and we can see, start seeing things here that are really interesting, okay? So we talk about, obviously, some, first of all, the, the word that jumps that immediately is attitudes. Okay? So there's some conceptual, some uh, definitions that equate norms with attitudes are the same thing. And I'm going to argue that they're not the same thing. Okay? But we also talk about rules. Very common thing that came out many of these uh, um, definitions was rules. Social norms are rules. Okay? I think we can understand that from a, a, a sociological perspective. Okay? So you look at the kind of 
two approaches we have to studying norm. We have the sociological perspective that emphasizes the notion of norms are there as rules to regulate behavior. They are there to solve problems. One problem we have is problem coordination. Okay? That's why we have signs, both signs, okay, to regulate who goes in the intersection so we can avoid accidents. There's an issue of coordination. There's also an issue of self-interest. In the absence of norms, people will just do what they desire and want, and that's going to be disastrous for society. Okay? So social, norm, uh, social norms in the sociological perspective come from, from this notion of social control. There's a need of society to regulate behavior. If you move to social psychology, they don't talk about norms, they talk about perceptions of norms. They talk about norms as a way of people to orient themselves, kind of benchmarks that people use in order to decide if they're adequate or not adequate, their behavior is acceptable or not. Okay? And it's also interesting norms in economics. Okay, we have all the economists also interested in the question of norms. Why do people cheat or don't cheat? Okay, and then a, a phenomenal work is done by Dan Ariely, I believe he's a Duke. We have economists that look at that. It's a perfectly good TED talk that describes that, and I highly recommend that. Okay, but but he talks about why people cheat. That could be in something like the kind of sweatshirt they wear. Okay, if people identify with that group of students, they will cheat or not, okay? And so all these kind of things bring norms in, and, and by the title of the book is Predictable Irrationality. It's completely predictable. It's just called norms. That's what it is, okay? And so you look at that and you say, what a mess. What a conceptual mess. We cannot agree or seriously agree on any definition here. It turns out not to be something that uh, uh, people wrote it actually before I was born. It's kind of nice. <laughs> but, if you look at Jack Gibson, that's a great paper about American Journal of Sociology, where he complained about the fact that sociology is a problem of defining and classifying norms. Okay? And he goes through this process of thinking through what norms are, ended up with nine different types of norms. Okay? But this dialogue, this conversation has been going for a while, and part of the issue was that we don't have an agreed upon or a, a, a working definition of what social norms are. And so what we try to do is come up with our own. And I think you can guess what happened. Okay, when you take 50 different uh, uh, explanations or uh, definitions, try to combine all of them, you get one really, really long definition. And, uh, but I want to point out there's some good stuff going on here that we need to pay attention to. Because the students came, really came through and thought through what norms are. The very first thing I want to point out is we're talking about a range of acceptable behaviors. Okay? This is not black or white. Okay? This is a continuum. And it's really important to think about norms as a continuum. And what I find useful here to guide my thought is social judgment theory and this idea of latitudes that we use for attitudes. Okay? There's a latitude of acceptance, which is how I can dress this talk today. What is, a, what, what is acceptable here for, for this meeting? Okay? And this, uh, this, uh, some of these latitudes can be very small, particularly if the norm is very strong okay, and very, very binding. Some of them can be very large. Okay, you can go from more restrictive to less restrictive, but it's really important to think about norms as range of possibilities of behaviors. Okay? And so and it's really important because that's how people, I'm going to use the word navigate, that's how people navigate social norms. Okay, so, so we have a range of behavior which is really important. It's also situational. And there's going to be another piece that is going to be very important later on, is we need to understand that norms operate in a particular situation. They don't apply all the time. They apply in a particular situation. So if I present normative information in a, in a situation that does not apply to the norm, we can't expect people to actually do something with it. Okay? There's no, they don't feel like they need to conform to the norm because it's not the right situation. Okay? We have different situation. Okay? And again, you can think about it in everyday life. Okay? How you approach a person in different position than you. How you approach a dean, how you approach a professor, how you approach a fellow student, and so forth. Okay, these are going to be a little bit different, and you need to think about that. The other thing about important about norm is that people believe that the majority of people behave in that particular way. As long as people believe the majority of people behave in a particular way, that's what they're going to stick to the norm. Otherwise, the norm disappear. Okay, think about the norm of speeding. Okay, well, let me guess here. Everybody here breaks the law. Okay. And so here's a norm that is a formal norm, okay, it's formalized by law, but in everyday practice, we don't respect that. Okay, in fact, 
If a police officer is going to stop me and give me a ticket, I'm going to be really, really angry. Why did you stop me? Everybody else is, is speeding, right? I engage immediately in this defensive, defensive processing information of the event, and I, and I don't think about myself as a deviant person in this particular case. Okay? And so it's really important that we believe the majority of other people, if I believe the majority of people speed, then the norm is speeding. And the same applies here. If I believe the majority of people drink, then the norm is drinking. And you can try and change that. But as long as I believe that's the case, that's going to be the norm. Okay? And then we know, and that's really important for communication, obviously, is to know that uh, uh, norms are formed, transformed, learned, activated, and then forced to social interactions. Okay, so if you try to start thinking about what is the role of communication in social norms, we see a broad range of things communication can do with social norms. And I'm going to be very interested later in the idea of activation, but also in this idea of learning. Okay? Because I think that's central to how we experience norms. Uh, individuals can conform or comply. And again, it can be misleading if you're looking at the outcomes of norms from the perspective of behavior. Because somebody can perform the norm but not really believe in the norm, just simply complying. Okay? But in terms of behavioral evidence, it's going to be exactly the same. So it's going to be a bit tricky to look at the outcomes of norms and know when norms are operating or some other motivation. And the other piece here is that norms have to be salient. They have to be salient to the individual. They have to be salient to the group. Okay? Because if they're not salient, people have no motivation to comply or conform to the norm. Okay? And so all these things that you end up with is a very big, uh, very big definition. The definition covers what norms are, the rules. It covers what are the sources or the causes of norms and also what are the outcomes. Okay, so it's a great definition because the only problem is you cannot work with it. Okay, how do you operationalize that? Okay, so I had to find another way of thinking about norms and I increasingly came to think about norms from an individual perspective as decision aids. Okay? Norms are there to help us make decisions. Okay? If you live out here and you drive your car and you get a red light, there's going to be nobody else on the street but you. Okay. Economic theory would expect you to continue driving. Why? Why are you stopping, wasting all this gas? But you stop. And here's the thing. You don't even think about that, right? The same thing with seat belts. You just put them on. You don't even think about that. Okay? We live in a very complex society, particularly complex relationships. We have different social roles, and we have different situations. We have different cultures, and so forth. And we need to be able to navigate this. It's a big mess. Nothing is linear in my world. Everything is one big chaotic thing. And we need to be able to navigate that. And the way to navigate that is by finding this kind of shortcuts. Otherwise, if we have to spend every single minute of our life thinking about what is the right thing to do, we're not going to be able to accomplish anything. Okay? And I want to emphasize that in much of literature on norms, norms are kind of a bad thing. Okay? The bad thing because they constrain individual behavior. They're there to put uh, limitations on your behavior. Right? So you behave according to some sort of a norm, what society wants you. So it's coercive in that sense. And that's not necessarily a good thing. I actually think about norms as something positive. Okay? Because without norms, we're not, we're not going to be able to function. Allow, us to, allow me to make a quick decision about things without thinking about it. And I'll give you an example, a simple one. You have somebody, a friend of yours, somebody in the family just recently passed away. And you go in and you, know, you have a sense of, what do I say, right? What do I say? And norms help you with that. They tell you exactly what you can say. And then just resolve that issue for you so you can move on and, and deal with it. So I think about norms as decision aids. Okay? And if you think about decision aids, you have really three different models. If you look at the literature, three different models that people use to explain how people experience that as decision aid. And norms are rules. Okay? We just mentioned that. That's a kind of the classic economic theory. Okay? This idea of that people are conscious of norms. There's sanctions attached to norms. Okay? And we know that if we're not going to comply or conform to the norms, we're going to be punished. Okay? So think about kind of a rational choice kind of thing. right? And look at the cost and benefit of doing something, of performing a behavior. And I think about norms in this context of the potential sanctions as a way of helping me reach this balance. Okay? So if I conclude that a, a violating a norm is going to be awful and be some terrible consequences and it's very high likelihood of consequences, then I'm going to go on and decide not to perform the behavior. So there's some notion here that people are going about the day thinking about this all the time. 
Should I comply with the norm or not? Should I do it or not? And so forth. And I think that's certainly one model there, and this is a model that was tested in a laboratory uh, setting, and, and, and there's a lot of uh, literature on that. Uh, uh, but it's clearly a, a kind of economic theory piece. It's notion of rational choice. And we feel comfortable with that, okay, because that's how we treat attitudes. Okay? And so one of the things I'm going to point out in a minute is that the first weapon we had when we started to studying norms was what we already knew about, which was exactly the social attitude. We study norms as where we study attitudes. That may not be adequate. Okay? A second way, which I, I got, came to see as, as more valid, is this idea of, of norms as internalized behavioral routines. <coughs> norms are about routines. Okay, it's what, what I typically do. I typically have a beverage of choice. Every right? time I go, I order it. Okay? But think about what happens when you go to a restaurant and says, can I get Diet Coke? And you say, we don't have Diet Coke. Oh my God. Okay, you, you, the new version of, of panicking, iced tea. Okay? Water will be the default, <coughs> right? For most people. But that's a notion, is we have a typical behavior. Okay? Not only as a group, but also as individuals. We are creatures of habit. Okay? We feel comfortable with our routines. Okay. And one of the things that norms do here is, again, once I internalize the norm, and seatbelt use is a good example. If you go in the morning to your car and put a seatbelt on without thinking about why you're doing it, you internalize that norm. You're operating automatically. Okay. You're not necessarily conscious of the norm. Okay. The behavior is automatic. Okay. All you need is a cue. Okay. And I think that's the other important thing about potentially world communication. You need a cue that will tell you this particular norm apply right now, such as having the red light. You know, you need to stop. Okay? Red light has no meaning other than the meaning we give it to. And so we agree on the meaning, red light means stop. I think that's where we start obeying the norm and we're automatically doing that. Okay? There's no thinking, should I stop? Should I go? And there's no other cause here. We don't think that way. Okay? So we don't want to experience it necessarily. I mean, think how uh, difficult it's going to be go throughout the day trying to make a decision about every single thing. We need this automatic behavior or the shortcuts, I wouldn't call them heuristic necessarily, but it's just the idea of a shortcut, a quick decision rule that will allow me to go on and move, particularly when something is not, and, and I, again, I point out that we do a lot of things automatically, right? You drive your car, you get in the car, you drive to campus, you don't even remember how you got here, right? Every, a lot of the stuff we do is automatic, okay? And I think norms work the same way, and that's actually the function of the norm, is allow us to do these kind of things. The other thing things like that got to be very interesting and more recently, and that tap back into George Gerber and his work about storytelling. Norms are a sense-making mechanism. We use norms to make sense of things. At the very basic level is if something is good or bad. Okay, we observe a behavior, and we can tell if it's good or bad. Okay? It helps us tell a story. Okay? And I want to emphasize this notion of telling a story. I need to, uh, norms are, in a way, an abbreviation of a story. Okay? I know that if the norm is there and the norm is violated, that tells me something about this particular person. Okay. Here's a person who just passed on, a homeless person, and did not give them any money. I have all, the whole sense of attribution that goes about that. Right? Here's somebody who violated the norm. What does it mean? Okay. And so people are using norms on a regular basis to make sense of things. To tell us something is appropriate or not appropriate. Okay. And that's how they make judgments and attribution. It taps into some other dimensions that are really relevant here. Anything from attributions, understanding of cause and effect of something, Okay. But also emotional overlay. Okay. I'm going to show that later on when I give the example of physical integration. But there's three different models. Okay. But we're really testing only one of them. Okay. So if you look at what we've done so far in terms of the extension, let me extend, extend that theoretically. If norms are rule, okay, that's what I'm thinking about, all I need to do, and I'm, 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 notice I'm going, coming from an intervention perspective. I'm trying to intervene now. What I need to do is to introduce a new sanction pattern. Either we introduce a new one or we enforce an existing one. Remind people there's sanctions. Remind people there are consequences for their behavior. Okay? And if I do that, I give them that kind of cue, presumably then it will weigh the information. Okay? Now I know that if I drink and drive and you catch me, you're going to take away my dance call, and he's not going to be very happy about that. Okay? You introduce another consequence there that people are thinking about that, and that will be the kind of things we typically do. Again, think about it as another belief about the behavior okay, that we, we're putting in, if using the theory as an action. If using norms as routine, then a, a trick here is to provide a situation with cues. The assumption is that the norm is already inside of us. We're already primed. Okay? 
And I think Klaus said that. Everything is learned in kindergarten, right? It's the notion that from we're being socialized to know what's good and bad, what's right and wrong. And all we have to do is see is to see some kind of a cue and it's automatically activating. We have a script in our head. Okay, and that cue will activate that script. So all I need to do is provide a cue to activate that particular script. And people will engage now what, what is it, will be the typical behavior. You know, you're typically doing this. There's a cue and it works everywhere. Marketing, put the Coca-Cola sign right above the restaurant sign so you know what to ask for when you're coming in. And so forth. you have to have this cue and, and activate that. So, it's, so this notion of priming activation, which, which is something we use also with antis. Okay, but it's already there. But, but I think it's a very powerful model to understand how uh, norms operate, how communication can be relevant here. And then you have norms of sense making. And, and, and the, 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 what I want to promote here is the idea of negotiation. People negotiate the norm. Okay? And, and when, what they negotiate exactly is the ideal behavior, what is acceptable, what is not. And there's all kinds of ways of communicating that. Okay? On my way here today, driving 95 was a truck driver driving was apparently very upset with the fact that we tried to limit the smoking because they had bumper stickers all over the back that told exactly what he thinks about our tyranny okay, against smokers. Okay? He was communicating with me. That's what he was doing. He was trying to negotiate a norm. Okay? And I think we need to be conscious of that because the key to our ability to adapt to changes in society is the ability to negotiate the norms. If we cannot negotiate the norm, we cannot adapt, and therefore we, uh, we cannot survive. So it's a really crucial piece here in terms of negotiation, and it's something that we have not paid attention to. Okay? Because negotiation now means it takes two to do that. Okay? And we're focusing on the individual, and that's a really important piece. Let's see some examples. So I'm going to start with the second one. It's the idea of activation model. Okay? This is one that was used most heavily in communication, and it came from, again, a general approach here is to provide some sort of a normative feedback. You're out of line. Okay? You need to know you're out of line. And because now you know, and you know what a typical behavior is, it gives you a benchmark to adjust your own behavior. Okay? So you can move in the direction of the norm if we just point out that you are uh, 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 deviating from this be benchmark. And again, what, what it's supposed to do is to activate the self-evaluation. I thought, well, I'm perfectly fine. I'm doing well. Now you're telling me I'm not. Now I'm thinking about that. Okay? And if I determine that I am, in fact, out of line, I'm going to move in the direction of the norm. Okay? And we do it all the time. Again, it builds on this idea. You know, one of the things we do automatically, social comparisons. Right? If we don't have any other information, okay, we come to a new campus, we try to figure out what people eat, how, what they drink, what they dress. The only have, uh, information we have is just watching people's behavior. We start comparing ourselves to them. Right? What's the first thing you do when you go to a wedding? You look at how you dress. And how other people, people, right? I mean, this is like I need, and you do it automatically. Okay? And so that's what we're trying to do here. So these are to provide normative feedback. And these are the social norm campaigns. You had one, one of these going on campus. And, and, and it's interesting because, in a way, chronologically, that's what brought me to social norms right after my dissertation. Because when I came out, there was a bunch of people, non social communication researchers, who uh, was really tired with the fact that we couldn't find anything to fight alcohol use. We use alcohol use, particularly in colleges, and come up with this idea of the social norm approach. Okay? And, and the basic idea here is that all we have to do is to give people information about the true norm. Okay? So the basic assumption here is very intuitive, by the way, okay? is that people misperceive the true social norms. Okay? We are terrible at making judgments. We know that. All kinds of judgments. We're often wrong. Okay? And so we tend to misperceive the norm. In other words, and most people in, in the context of college drinking tend to overestimate the extent to which peers are using alcohol. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Media, advertising, so forth. But the fact remains, people are overestimating that. And so in that particular theory, there's a notion that if you overestimate the norm, you experience more social pressure when you need to drink in a non-normative level. In other words, in what we call high risk of binge drinking. Okay? And so the solution is very simple, right? All I have to do is to correct this perception. All I have to tell people is exactly what the norm is. People then can use that accurate yardstick as a way of evaluating their own behavior. And now, I, you know, if you tell me right in here, there's an example that the most students drink about three or four drinks in a sitting. Oh my God, I'm drinking seven. Then I can adjust my behavior. And that's the basic idea is that I'm going to move. Think about regression to the mean. I'm going to move 
to the average and typical behavior of the group member. Okay, so all I have to do is just present this information, and, and, and many of these campaigns were going on. Okay, and and there's, a, there's been a lot of uh, debate about their effect, efficacy. Okay, people were asking questions about, uh, particularly people from our field, challenged pretty heavily this argument here. Because they said, this is a, that's not going to work. That's not going to work because the message is pretty badly designed. Okay? Because that's what we do best, just focusing on the message. Okay? So the message issue is, is that, I'll just give you a quick example. If I tell you that one in five, that's the message I'm going to say, one in five students drink. If you somebody drink alcohol, do you think you have a problem? One in five students drink. What would you do with this information? What do you think students do with this information? I'll tell you one in five drink, and that's supposed to change your behavior. I'm going to tell you what they do. They switch it. That means four and five drink. So what do you want from me? The no one is drinking. The message is not effective. Okay? It's not threatening anything because it just reinforce what I already know. The majority of students drink alcohol. It is the norm. Okay? And so part of the issue was this issue of how people process information. There was no intention. There was no design in terms of processing this information. The other piece here is when I tell you the typical student on campus, what does it mean to any of you? Is that some, something you can identify with? A typical student on campus. Okay. For some people, a typical student on campus is me. Okay. And so I'm projecting for my own behavior to project over other, other people. Okay. So you know, we can relate to our friends. We can relate to our best friends. Okay. We can relate to some uh, known targets. But if you tell me the typical student, students don't understand what the benchmark is. Who is the typical student? And so there's all kinds of questions, challenges we introduced as a field to the social no marketing campaign. And I'm going to show an example here. I'm one in five. 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 Are you? Are you one in five? Two thirds of Rutgers students stop at three or fewer drinks. One in five don't drink at all. This message brought to you by the Center for Communication and Health Issues at the Are You Sure campaign. Got a lot of voice. It's not about graduate students doing that. But when I came to Rutgers, I had an opportunity to test this because they were running campaigns called the Are You Sure campaign. And you saw the two messages of the campaign. One in five students don't drink. So I want to make sure that people know that some people choose to abstain from alcohol. That's perfectly fine. And the other one is that two-thirds students stop at a more normative level than he thought. Okay, they started at three or four drinks, or actually three their drinks, and, and therefore a, a, it's, it's not a seven, eight that people thought it was. Okay? And again, it was based on looking at misperceptions, and misperceptions are highly correlated with level of drinking. The more you misperceive, there's a strong correlation with level of drinking. Of course, there can be a reverse causal direction here, which is potentially what happened. The more you drink, you can misperceive. Okay, you project from your own behavior to others. But that association was the reason for this campaign. Okay? And so we wanted to look at this campaign, look closely into it, and just look at all kinds of things communication people are concerned about. So we've done an evaluation. Okay? And so we used the survey data. We collected a panel of freshman students. So the, the idea was to bring people who are brand new to the campus environment, even know nothing about the current drinking norm. Okay? We got them during orientation, so that's before the even semester starts. And we measure all kinds of things. You can see it. it's 250 things we measure. We measure a lot of things there, okay, about them. Then we follow them up uh, the uh, first month, during the semester, week four, and then again at the end of the semester. Okay, so we had a three-wave uh, panel here. Uh, the retention rate was high in part because we use incentives. Uh, so they got each one of them got about ten. It got ten dollars, get certificate at Amazon for uh, returning the survey. It actually was an online survey. So completing survey online, and it was also a raffle. You know, we had uh, then the iPods it was amazing. So just that got a lot of people to do that, and and students had to be confirmed. And uh, we use a lot of actual credit in our courses, and we have very high retention rates. And that's a nice thing with student sample. And and I want to point out for the record, the only reason I'm studying students is because students are the target audience. This campaign, I'm not making any extension on anybody else. So I'm, I'm, I'm within my, my target audience right here, okay? And so you can see that, that we had a 74% uh, uh, retention rate. We, we lost a lot of men from engineering type of things. <laughs> I guess they were not interested in my surveys anymore. 
Uh, but, but that's what we lost. And of course, we had to adjust. Nice thing about getting a student sample is we, we, it's a finite population. We know exactly what distributions are. We can adjust for these. And, 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 and these were adjusted. Again, uh, 57% female, 60% Caucasians. And nice thing about Vargas, well, again, very diverse campus. It's not the 85, 89% you see in all of these uh, evaluations. So we got some uh, differences there. The mean age was, was 18, was it was 18.2 to be exact, but who's counting the point two? We just have to round it. 83% uh, people on campus because they have to. Okay, so we just got a chance to, to see what's going on on, on campus. About 20%, one in five, were in, indeed upstairs. Uh, and 78% use, use alcohol in the past 30 days. Uh, um, it's not a party school, it's no Penn State. Okay, but, but we still have some, some uh, making any. But, but, uh, but there's some, some variation in terms of drinking. Uh, also, the majority drink. That's not different than the national average, about 82%. Okay? And again, they, they report about 3.5 drinks per sitting when, when they uh, go into it's a measure of, of, of binge. We don't use the word binge. We use high risk uh, in drinking. And, and so that was a measure of high risk drinking. So uh, we can see a distribution there. Well, here's, here's a list of measures. Okay? And then and again, that's, that's why communication people are important, because we care about all this stuff. And nobody else does. But look at the outcome measures. We have if we look at alcohol related expectancies, obviously, perceived alcohol use by peers, perceived peers' approval or disapproval of alcohol use, alcohol use intention, and self reported alcohol use. And if you walk with Bob in all of these, because we're using them routinely. Compared exposure, okay? And that's pure Bob, by the way. That's his influence. Frequency and recall of source. So it's not, we just ask him, we just give an example. We ask, when do you see the ad? And somebody responded in the men's bathroom. No. Okay? And so I went to check. There was an ad about the urinals. Okay? There was also an ad by uh, the US Army that says the future is in your hand, which is really interesting if you think about the situation. <laughs> but we had, we had, sorry, but, but we, we, had, we, had a competing, we had a competing message there. Okay? So, but, but they were right. They were putting these ads right there. And, and so we verified recall, and I think that's really important. We also have the indirect exposure, okay, amount of exposure they got generally uh, about this, this topic from all kinds of sources. We also ask them about to, to evaluate the message. Okay, remember, that's our main concern, is you have a really bad message. So we ask them about credibility. Is it a credible message? Talk about the quality and, and usefulness of the information they provide. We look for bias processing. Uh, things like social derogation, I don't believe the information came from health services, by the way. I don't believe the information. You know, it's, it's the university trying to influence me. A message discounting, again, this notion of I don't believe the message, I don't know what sample you use, or you ask, you ask the wrong people. Okay? And, and then uh, also the potential reactance and threat to self-concept. Okay, so we looked at all of these as potential things we want to uh, be looking at. And we looked at a lot, a lot of confounders. Okay? We looked at the uh, ocovarious, so we looked at demographics, uh, uh, again, general exposure, uh, exposure to alcohol advertising, uh, personality traits, Manifestation seeking, so forth, social desirability, uh, exposure to other programs. So, so uh, I'm putting it there. You're not going to see any of this stuff because I'm going to try to put something more simple here. But I just want to tell you it was, it was a very serious evaluation of, of that campaign and trying to answer a question. It was also a longitudinal evaluation. So it's not a cross section, we're just tracking people, uh, which, was, uh, which was unique. So here's some, some information. Again, I'm trying to make it easy because, again, the point I'm trying to make is about the conceptualizing norms here. Okay, so you can see that in terms of exposure, we had uh, close to zero exposure. Well, there was two people who saw the campaign before they even came to campus, which is little, virtually impossible unless they have a sibling or something like that. But, but, but you know, for all purposes, it was zero. Um, in week four, 13% of the panel reported exposed to the campaign. Again, I mean, exposure meant they can recall the messages. Okay, these are verified uh, recall. And then we, by week 12, we get to 49%. And we didn't reach uh, the whole entire population, obviously, but, but I think it's a pretty, pretty decent uh, um, progression in terms of the exposure. Message liking, uh, the numbers here, that's a one to five scale, with three is, with three is, a, is a neutral. They didn't particularly care about the message. You didn't like or dislike them anyhow, and then uh, no matter, uh, 12 weeks into that, they didn't look any better than four weeks into it, okay? And so the issue, issue is that, and part of the issue with this campaign has been very ineffective messages, okay? And, 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 and the reason for that, I'll just say now, is because remember, norms apply in a particular situation, okay? Just theoretically, hypothetically talking about norms, it's not gonna activate the norm. 
it has to be in the right situation. Okay? And, and just giving it the cue alone without the situation is not going to have any influence on people. No misperception, so that, that's measured. So we know we kind of estimated based on the surveys around on campus what is a true level of drinking on campus. And then we took, we, took, we asked you how much you think people drink, and we just uh, uh, took the difference. And, and you either misperceive, most people misperceive mean that they overestimated the number of drinks on average that people drink on campus. And so you can see that, uh, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a, um, something that's consistent with the literature. These campaigns are able to correct these perceptions. Okay, again, so, so think about it as a learning process. Now I learn, it's, it's like a test. Okay, I learn, I dump, and then I forget, but it has no consequences for my behavior. Okay, so there, there is evidence that campaigns are affecting the genuine perception, but then people, students are not translating into behavior. Okay, there's only jumping though, you see that because of how much pressure they feel themselves, 1% of people feeling pressure to drink, you see that there was not much change either because people felt that pressure, particularly if you're a freshman, that's why we chose freshmen. Okay. As seniors are more resilient. First of all, they know how much the drink costs and they don't want to spend money on that. Okay. And B, they have other responsibilities. They have jobs and so on stuff. They don't have time to drink. Okay. Freshmen on the other hand, you know, that's where the, the problem is. Okay. Alcohol use, so we, we again, so so hardly any change in terms of uh, people who report on, on binge drinking. And again could have been biased by the fact that it's a freshman sample. Okay, and then tend to, there's a lot of good Samaritans, even though most of them are underage, there's a lot of good Samaritans that give them alcohol. Okay, so it's really easy to get alcohol uh, on campus. Um, okay, I'm gonna try and not be too technical here. So that was kind of thing as a population level, what was going on in the population, but really the evidence comes from following the person over time. Okay, and so this is a panel data. And there's all kinds of ways of analyzing panel data. You can do some kind of lag analysis. You can do some fixed effects types of model. I chose a random effect model. And the reason I chose the random effect model was because it allows that particular viral I was interested in, norms, to vary across waves. Okay, so that, or the thing about it's a fixed quantity, something that's fixed over time, I think norms are alive, the change. Okay, so I want to be able to capture that. And that's why I chose this particular model here. And so it's, it's an SCM-based um, um, Okay, not the SCM based uh, um, approach that is used for estimation. And, uh, so, really interested in, uh, I'm going to study about behavior. I'm going to tell you right now there was no effect on behavior. So, that, you know, that just takes the big elephant out of the room. No effect on behavior. Okay? Uh, I was interested more in the question about the effect of norms. Can this stuff affect norms? Because it then validates to some extent that particular model I was presenting before. This idea that we can think about as attitudes. Okay. All we have to do is provide information, that's it. And people will change. Okay. Does it actually change the norms? And we see the descriptive norms, yes, but not injunctive norms. Okay. Now, there's two model, uh, uh, the model estimates two parameters. So if you think about what I'm trying to estimate here is, um, again, without getting, I'm interested in inter individual growth. I want to follow it over time and see how it goes. Uh, if there's any change, I'm very interested to see if there's any change in perceptions of norms. That's what I'm trying to capture here. That will be the slope, right? Okay. And then I want to know if there's any uh, uh, differences in baseline in terms of how people perceive the norms. Are they all start at the same point? Think about the intercept, right? It's the point where it cuts the axis, right? That's the that's a fixed quantity for everybody, but it may not be a fixed quantity for everybody. Some people have higher level or higher degree of perception of norms than other people. I want to be able to accommodate for that. Um, we estimated the model, and, and here's what we found, which I think was interesting. Okay, so we look at the mean variance of the intercept. The slope show evi no evidence of difference on jumping nodes. In other words, you saw that from the previous slide. Most people feel pressure on them to drink, and that's really the important norm here. It's not what people do; it's the fact that I'm expected to drink. That's really factor more heavily into my decision, my behavior. Okay, and that has been very stable. Okay, has been resistant to change from the outset. Okay, so we're not able to influence that. Uh, there, there was, though, uh, um, uh, for descriptive nodes, we did see some change here that, that, uh, that it's relevant. The bottom line, here are the key findings. I'm going to throw in some other things for us to think about very quickly. Exposure to campaign has a moderate effect on the increasing misperceptions. That, that's consistent with literature. I, I, I accept that. You know, these campaigns can change misperceptions. Okay? However, they cannot change behavior. Okay? There was no impact on behavior whatsoever 
not even mediated, okay, through some of the stuff that Wajir is doing, looking at uh, descriptive norms, in fact, mediated through injunctive norms. There was no difference on injunctive norms, right? So it cannot mediate the association there. We also found other stuff. I mean, if you start looking at subgroup analysis, you find some other go things going on. There was uh, effects varied by personal level of involvement in the behavior. So if, I, if I'm abstaining, I don't care about alcohol, I didn't pay attention to your message because it's irrelevant to me. Okay? On the other extreme, the high level drinkers, we just talked about how they engage in defensive processing. You told me, and you know, we've done these focus groups also in class, and immediately that's the first thing the students say. What does it mean? Four and five? Do drink, you know. Well, what's the problem? Everybody drinks, okay? Or well, the majority of people drink. Okay, so engage in defensive processing. In fact, what we found out that the more you were exposed to this message, in a way, it got you angry, and you extreme your attitudes. Okay, not the behavior necessarily, okay, but in other papers we found out that there was an impact on behavior. So in other words, if you think about the effect of these messages, they have no effects on people who are abstainers. They have a polarizing effect in the wrong direction, you know, it's a boomerang, on people who are high-level drinkers. And then people in the middle are more open to this information. They change their misperceptions, but they don't change their behavior. Again, the reason for that, and I use this example, I want to illustrate it because it's a really important point. If I tell you eat five foods, of, uh, seven foods of vegetable a day right now, you may take, take it in and may decide that you want to do it, but you cannot act on that behavior right now. You don't have fruits and vegetables unless we still have a serving outside. Okay? What if I put it in the supermarket? The minute you step into the supermarket, you see that sign about the produce say, well, now you can act. It's a more effective way of getting you to behave. Those operate the same way. It has to be in the right situation. Okay? It cannot be something that I can put in your head because you're going to forget five minutes about that. Plus, you don't feel you have control over it. I know I should be drinking today, but I'm in the party right now, and this nice lady tells me that I need to drink. How can I say no? Okay, so self-efficacy is very low in many of uh, the studies that I've uh, been doing. It, the effects also do by group sell, yes, some you know, fraternities, okay, you know, obviously. Yeah. Alcohol is a very important part of the culture. <coughs> they take it seriously, okay, it's a form of art. And so, for them, they're highly resistant to these kind of messages, those people who don't care about alcohol, again, it's not important for the group, kids I'm hanging out with, there was a really little effect in this, this. And then social identification. This is a nice piece I pu we published in a, a health communication that looked at this kind of uh, differences. It depends on who, who the target is. If I'm you know, so talking about best friends and friends, your evaluation, when it's perception of the norms that will be different, than talk about students in general, okay? The closer the target gets to you, the more likely you are to perceive more accurately, okay, the behavior, because you're having social interactions with them. You know how much they drink because you've been out with them. There's a big unknown, students on campus, and I'm asking them to estimate, and we already said that people are really lousy making estimates. Okay? But these are not necessarily estimates that are consequential. Okay? Let me move to something more cheerful. Okay? Yeah. Sanction pattern. I'm going to try to move forward because I know. But here's the, here's the uh, argument here. The argument here is, and, we, and, and what we've done here is, is the type of studies that got my attention. That there's fMRI studies that look at what happened to people when you violate norms. And, and, and the uh, message that comes from that is what, what's operating is not attitude. What's operating is emotion. When we violate a norm, we feel it. We don't think about that. We feel it. We feel shame. We feel guilt. We feel lousy. We can actually feel it. Okay? That's different than the way we experience attitudes. Okay? Because if I violate an attitude, I can change my mind right now. And I feel totally comfortable with that. I don't necessarily feel I'm inconsistent. Okay? But if I have a strong emotion, a negative emotion, that's really discomfort. That's something that I need to alleviate. And so I need to address it. Okay? And that's what's pushing me in. And then we've got some focus group. It's a very large group of focus group students here. But here's the basic idea. And I want to go uh, quickly to some of the findings. This is what we learned from the students. We asked them about how they treat these campaigns and so forth. And we've done it by gender and alcohol use level and so forth. But here's the thing. Violations of the law of negative feelings. I just mentioned that. People feel shame and guilt. We ask them, how do you know you drank too much? Because I vomited and I feel really bad about that. Okay? Norms are selling in the presence of others. Norms really matter when other people are there. If I vomit in my own bathroom, who cares? I don't necessarily feel anything, but if I vomit in front of a group of people and these people go to school with me, now I'm embarrassed and now I feel it. Okay? So people have to be there. At least people have the concept of people being there for, for norms to operate here. 
And again, norms of experience differently depending on a social role. You may be the enforcer. I'm the guy who's making, making sure I'm the designated driver, making sure that everybody drinks to the norm, normative level. And, and so I'm enforcing the norm. There's somebody who's on the other side of that, the receiving end of that, and they experience norms differently. Okay. So we need to combine this somehow into this idea of how to produce some, a better message, so to speak. And we end up with shame appeal. Okay. And this idea is that we need to activate this emotion. We can get people, we can activate this emotion in people. They will process the message a little bit better. Shame arises a concern of others. Okay. So I'm, I'm worried about how others evaluate me. Okay. This is different than guilt. In guilt, I feel that I've done something wrong for someone, I want to fix it. Here, I'm just worried about how people judge me. Okay. If people found out what happened, uh, how I behave, what's the consequences of that? It's an unpleasant state, so think about this dissonance, cognitive dissonance, but, but three times in, in strong and intensity. Okay? It's not about in cognitive dissonance, I, I made the wrong decision, I can justify it. You know, I feel it. It's really uncomfortable, right? We feel guilt or shame. We want to alleviate that. There's a strong motivator, right? motivating factors to try and move in terms of cognitive change or behavior change. And then, uh, so the argument here is if we can activate shame, we can basically engage people in self-regulation. Okay, now they know they've done something wrong, they violate the norm, that will get them to uh, behave in a particular way. Um, experiment. Again, with students, so it's okay. Uh, 75 students randomly assigned to see their shame, uh, shame appeal or uh, anti regular typical risk anti-alcohol ad. We use that image, okay? And the reason for that is, you have seen images when people are going in toilets, that, that was not what people in our sample recognized. This is, the, this is believable. They see it all the time. Okay? Notice the, the holding of the hair back. Okay? That's something that's really strong. It's a bonding experience. Okay? And so we, we, we use this information we got from students to uh, create a sad. And the difference was that the risk appeal emphasized, again, we, we emphasized the immediate, the typical ad, you're going to get sick going to vomit, you're going to get into an accident, and so forth. Okay? Then the other one emphasized the possibility of being ridiculed, rejected, and, and you're going to embarrass your family and friends, and so forth. Again, it's a ground in relationships here. And so then we're told to imagine yourself in a certain situation. You know, happen to someone else, imagine yourself in a certain situation. I want to show you something that is a video version of that. It's from New Zealand, and that's what's effective. Uh, but, but you can see how it will play out. Oh my god, look at that girl. Oh, I know her. She works in my office. Oh my god, she is disgusting. I was waiting to tell everyone on Monday. So let's see how people reacted to that. Okay? The experience shame and the shame appeal. Okay? Because they can actually imagine themselves in some situation. It happens to quite a few of them. Okay? So it's not it's believable experience for them. Okay? Notice also experienced guilt, though, okay? And I suspect that's to do with the fact that she held the hair back. And so, so you're not putting your friend in a nasty situation, or family member in a nasty situation, you feel guilt about that. So shame is not invoked separately of, of guilt in this case. Uh, th there was no difference in terms of fear. Uh, in terms of defensive processing, which is a combination of whether they thought that it was credible, whether the source was acceptable, and so forth, we see that uh, in, in, in there is difference. There was less defensive processing uh, with the shame appeal. Uh, the uh, perceptions of norms so was also, again, a, a change. It was a reduction. Then I think about the number of uh, uh, peers who drank or consume alcohol. There was no change in intentions. Okay? And, and uh, that's because these people here lie. Then <laughs> <laughs> there's no effect. I mean, every, every time you ask me, you have, a, you have intention, I absolutely, the, the 1.8 means that I absolutely definitely would not drink four or five drinks the next sitting, and all lying. Okay? That's why there's no difference in this case. I want to show you, for me, watch for me, this one for, for a second. For me, for me. Successful living is about being healthy. My body is still developing. And alcohol can cause serious damage. Damage. Damage to my vital organs. It's not about feeling the high. It's about rising. Rising to the occasion. Every day we do stuff that's going to affect the rest of our lives. Drinking too much alcohol can kill you. Life is full of choices. It's not about getting arrested with a fake ID. It's about self-respect. That's why I make the right choice. I'm showing you that because I think there's another way we can think about that. There's something called personal norms. Okay? 
When you think about personal norms, it goes map very nicely to social norms. There's a typical me, what I typically do. Why do I do something that's not typical? I feel upset about that, okay? But there's also national, the ideal me. What kind of person do I want to be or aspire to be, okay? And we're trying to use that retaining bad news right now. We're trying to provide normative feedback that will let you, cause you to think about you. Not about the, everybody else, but about you. What does it say about you that you tan so much, okay? Right, you're being rewarded for your appearance. But what kind of person are you if all you care about is your appearance? Okay? And so another way we're testing right now is going from personal norms, going from social norms to personal norms, and see how people process this information. Again, trying to get from another uh, angle here. Um, if you can bear with me for two more seconds, uh, is, is, is what I'm mostly excited about. I'm excited about this notion of negotiation. This is the third path. Okay? So we talked about this notion of thinking about norms as attitudes. Just providing information, and people will change. And we say there's not strong evidence for that. Okay? And then we talk about this idea of activation, which is, is a lot of value. Okay? It makes complete sense. But we need to find a better way to use this activation. Because when we provide a message, it's not necessarily the case that people are in a situation when they need this message to be delivered. Okay? So think about social just in time. How do I deliver the message to this person when they need it the most? It's like you know, your little mom standing on your shoulder and says, don't drink. It'll embarrass me, okay? But it has to be in the situation when you're getting into drinking, okay? And that's, that's a tricky thing. I think the other path here, which is I'm excited about, is, is going back to the idea of telling stories. Is I think about social norms, mainly as a sense-making instrument. It does make sense. It's, there's a story behind a norm, and every student has a story behind their norm, okay? And some stories are the same exact uh, ideas behind them. But think about it as kind of a, a frame, it's a nice way of thinking about it. It's a frame. It's how I make sense of the behavior, or why I'm drinking, and so forth. And it's really important because when you negotiate the norms with other people, and there's too, there's too many things on negotiating. My grad student who opened that, uh, Shukawa does finishing a dissertation, talks about two types of negotiation. Negotiation means sometimes this individual negotiation where I know I'm doing something wrong, but I'm going to let myself do it. Okay, so I'm finding using communication to justify it my deviant behavior, okay? Kids are very good at that. I didn't push him, he started first, okay? I negotiated the norm, okay? But the other notion of negotiation, of course, is this idea of communication between people about norms. And what this communication is about is about telling stories, okay? And just to uh, give you a sense of what's going on here, and uh, hopefully it's on a high note, this is a prisoner reintegration project. People don't want to help prisoners. They go out of jail and they come back. Because nobody's willing to give them a job, nobody's going to give them transportation, and people are not generally willing to help them. Some of these people are in jail for minor drug offenses. They sold drugs. A lot of them are women, and they get no second chance. So how do we change public attitudes? Okay, it just comes from the main political communication point of view. And what I'm saying is that we need to change the norm, we need to change the story. Okay? And one of the things we did here, and I'm, I'm just going to do for a few minutes, think about, actually, let me describe to you. When I think about, I'm going to find out what people have in their mind when they think about prisoners. I think about dangerous people, right? People that want to get locked. I don't want to help this person. I can think of other people that I want to help. Veterans, other people who earn that. Okay? I don't want to help a prisoner. What if I change the story in their head? And the story, I think imagine this ad, and I want to say fine. But you see a crib. That's a video. The video starts with a crib. And then it pulls out, and you hear the lullaby, the back one, and you see the boss. Then you realize this baby is in jail. And you realize that the baby mom, who's like any other mother, like my mother and your mother, okay, is there as well. And she has to serve time. And this, son, this child has to grow up in this environment. Okay? There's no reason for her to be in jail. She served the time. She paid her dues. But she's there because we're tough on drugs. Okay? You show that to parents and think, start thinking about how I may see things differently. Now they may be in a story. This is a mom. This is not a prisoner anymore. It's a parent like me who has a right to take care of her own child. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is that one of the things we can do with norms is to provide different stories. And it's important to provide different stories because without that, and when we show that, and uh, people hands we walk on that, uh, uh, when we took a documentary that followed somebody, and, and you can see how frustrating it is for somebody to try and make it on the outside. I want to do good. You just, you guys don't let me. People see things differently. When they see this differently, the state of New York changed the law. Okay. 
And so, again, going back to what George Gerber was saying, this value to think about telling stories. And I think that's what the thought of one of them, is how do we tell stories in order to change norms? I think it's a key to understanding what norms are. That was my story. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. chew tobacco, you know, deal with it, okay? But I think part of that discourse we have, and this dialogue we have is really important, happen in these public spaces, okay? And so, and it can be done in multiple ways. I mean, you know, it can be done with art, it can be done in all kinds of forms. But this idea is that a, 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 this notion of, what, a, think about it, if, if norms are automatic, okay, if, I'm, if I go about my day not thinking about them, the one time I think about them is when I have a conflict with the norm. When I have a personal problem with that, okay? When I have a personal problem with that, now I have a choice. I either comply, because I want to avoid potential sanctions, or I speak up, okay? And take a stand and try to change the other person, okay? And, and again, part of that will be engaging this kind of conversation where we agree on a new meaning, okay? In Shukta, my, my, my student will work on a dissertation, look at the, uh, um, um, Indian immigrants. Look at the first generation Indian immigrants into this country who live by the Indians' rules, particularly about privacy, and that's their focus. Is in that families nothing is private. Okay, I have, a, I have the right to search your room at any given moment. If you email to somebody, I need to know about that. I need to know who you date, and so forth. That's a no. And then you have the American-born kids who are, uh, appreciate privacy. Okay, it's a major value for them. And now you have a potential clash. Okay. And, and her, her dissertation describes how parents and, and kids negotiate a new understanding. Some of it has to do with stretching the latitudes I was talking about. Okay, so now, you know, it's our your son. Can, you know, can I come back home instead of 11.30? Can I go at midnight? And, you know, okay, midnight, fine. We're stretching it a little bit, okay? Part of that is stretching, constructing this norms, so we, we have a new meaning, a new agreement, okay? And once the parents do that, you know, what happens in my family, they, I get to talk to somebody else, and we do it all the time as parents, right? I mean, we ask other parents, what do you do? How do you get vegetable in your kids' uh, meals? And so how do you deal with this? So this information, now, classic diffusion, right? It's all diffusing, and that's how it's to end up changing the norms and being able to adapt better to our environment. Okay, the environment is changing. The, the, the example is cyberbullying. Think about this notion of part of the problem with online interactions, we have no norms, right? I mean, it's not, it's not clear what, what is okay or not okay to say. It's not regulated, okay? 
It's a classic, almost annoying by Dukan. Why there's no notion of there's no norms, and it's opened the door to all kinds of things and misunderstandings that we have to deal with. Okay? And one of the things we may need to do is to introduce some norms, introduce some structure into it. It doesn't ex that exist in face-to-face -face interactions, but it doesn't exist there. Okay? And so when we think about designing spaces, norms must be an important piece of that. You design your organization, you design a new space for people, it has to, you have to take into account the norms and how people they, they, they build flexibility in terms of negotiating it so they can move on and the organization can adapt to changes. I think that's really crucial here. I think, you know, we, we, we have too many examples in this country of fixation on a particular story, okay? Abstinence only programs. I, it's not okay for me to tell a kid, have sex, it's okay, but use a condom. I just cannot say that, okay? And that's put some kind of constraint on what I can do. And again, that's why I like the Australian campaigns. They have no inhibitions, okay? And sometimes they'll be more effective. So I think that's, that's a piece where you, you don't understand. I think, I think we, 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 we treat norms too casually. It's a very complex thing, and we need to study it more, and, 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 and study is a complex construct. Uh, it's not an attitude. I think that's, that's a wrong way of going about trying to change norms, just providing information to people. So. Um, thanks. Do you find that n norms operate differently depending on the subject matter? So for example, here we're talking about abstinence from alcohol use or abuse, which I'd say that in maybe college culture, there may be conflicting norms. That is, that the norm may be to go against the norm and to end up binge drinking and blacking out may be sort of more of a funny occurrence than something that many people would feel shameful about. But then when we're thinking about sort of norm behavior in, in, other, in other areas, such as maybe the use of racist or sexist language or bullying, um, do you feel that public sort of campaigns to change norms might be easier in, in some areas it, than it's a, it's, a, it's a factual slap that I was talking about. Okay, if you go to a pen game and you pass around beer, does anybody want to say anything about that? Probably not, just pass on the beer. It was a fun, okay? That was, by the way, one of the first experiences. I, I came as an expert of drug driving. Okay, I went to Texas, a, a conference where all the big people I cited my dissertation were there, talking about how we can prevent kids from drinking and driving. At the end of that day, people got to the cars, drove to the bar, got drunk, and drove back home. Okay? That's what norms are. Okay? And then, see, see, nothing wrong with that. Okay? So that's what the latitudes. If you start smoking in that stage, what do you think will be the reaction? I bet you there will be some, one or two people who tell them to stop smoking. We have a small latitude for smoking, much larger latitude for drinking. It's a function of how we, the latitude of these kind of topics. The third topic is an abstinence. I mean, again, we, we will not be able to get fun. Well, John, well, John, John won't get fun for abstinence, but we cannot get, we cannot, I mean, we cannot go and, and, and say something that is perceived to be more. Okay? And I think that's the kind of issues that we have. I, I have another great example. Uh, just having the I, I do a lot of work in Princeton University Library. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Princeton Public Library, a wonderful library they have there. Um, I, I walk around and I, and I see, and I it's kind of disgusting, but I see a, a, an older person watching porn on, on the computer. And so I go to the library and I said, I don't feel comfortable with that. You know, I know that there's free everything, but there's kids here, I'm a parent, I don't feel comfortable with that. Okay? She tells me, we sat down, we thought about the rules, and we agreed that we're not going to censor anything. Okay? As, as she's speaking, there's a bunch of teenagers going up the stairs, okay? and they make a lot of noise. And then she turns to them and looks at one of the guy who went to Moscow and says, you, stop, go down the step quietly, and come up quietly. <laughs> okay, so, porn, watching porn is okay, making noise in the library is not. Okay? It's latitude, and that's exactly what you negotiate. Okay? And I think that's part of the, the story I'm trying to tell today. It's about the stories we have. Okay? And that's how we need to negotiate that. Sorry. I was wondering where uh, students saw the television ad on campus. Well, we had it. It's, it's a very interesting campaign because we actually have the students generate. We have a whole course, and the students make this course, generate these kind of messages, and, and then disseminate it in all kinds of places. So this is our UTV. So. Major channel. 
<laughs> and, and, and you see it there, and the officer see it that, you know, there's a, my colleagues uh, uh, who, who are doing that, this is the uh, yes, right but now we're going to do the that as well. Also assess the effect that they had on people who actually disseminating that. So the students themselves will disseminate the peers, but also the effect on them. So I think also an interesting example was somebody who's a bartender, whose job is to serve as many drinks as possible, who decided not to do it then. It just it would not let anybody drink more than three drinks because it was part of their thing. Okay? And so they saw it on, 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 uh, saw it on bus stops. Okay? They get the message, messages out there. There's a lot of uh, freebies we give. It's a big thing about this. We give free stuff. Okay? Well, I, on that. I figured there would be lots of chances to see the, the more static ads. The, the, uh, like the fact that she doesn't remember that you recall that. Remember, we went for recall because if I ask a student, yeah, I'll give you a pen. You tell me that you saw it. You tell me that you saw it. Okay? Uh, we just want to verify recall. So if they couldn't recall accurately the message, we just didn't uh, count it as a folder. I have a question. So I think I, this is something I've been struggling with and trying to understand. Norms is just one thing. <laughs> well, one thing maybe to help answer is um, I think on the one hand, we have a need to affiliate with others, and that's where these norms serve um, to promote behavior. But at the same time, youth especially have a need for autonomy. So I was wondering if you have a sense how we can predict when people are going to try to follow norms or when norms are going to drive people to the opposite. Well, we, we, uh, I think it's in social, in social and personal norms and social norms. Okay? But what's the norms and social norms converge? When I accept, okay, if I accept the idea that killing another person is a bad thing to do, I have no confidence with the norm, right? That's, that's the essence of conformity. I accept the social norm. I think it's a good idea. I think the use of the seatbelt on is a good idea. That's why I put it on. And I never question it again. It's where I find, I think that that's what Chicago dissertation is all about. She's looking at these young people who want to have some freedom, okay? They think they deserve freedom by American rules, by American norms. But the parents disagree, okay? And here's the thing that's really important about norms. Again, as I said before, if you change your mind, change your attitude, there's, there's not always consequences for that. But norms are endowed in relationships. So when, by definition, when you choose to a, a, a violate a norm, you're going to have a problem with that person who's holding that norm. Okay? So they have to think really hard about how do I balance, and that's going to help make a decision. That's why I'm measuring. What I perceive to be the damaged relationship from violating or disobeying the parents okay? versus what, what, what I stand to gain by lying to them. Okay, what's the cost? Okay? And, and what she shows very nicely is that for these instances, people do plan interaction. Okay, you, know, uh, you know, my kids know is, uh, you know, certain things come to dad, other things go to mom. And it's really good to get dad and mom against one another. <laughs> okay, it always works well. Okay? So, so they, they, they have this, again, this kind of scripts that they have. It might be based on interaction with your parent, and you know that your father is more strict. So there's no point of even bringing this up. Okay. So maybe you choose the other form of negotiation, which is, uh, you know, what he doesn't know doesn't kill him. Okay. So I continue doing, but but what would happen? Then you feel bad about it, right? I'm not part of that. So then you balance the consequences of, of violating the norm, and you make a decision about that. This question comes to you from Peter Bussey, who is watching from Portugal via the web. Oh, wow. It is a long question. I apologize. One of the findings of my dissertation, which tried to prime the inductive norms of Latinos about getting tested for HIV, was that rather than making Latinos base their intentions more on perceived norms, it happened the opposite. Latinos based their intentions less on norms when they saw a normative message that tried to make injunctive norms salient. The findings led me to think that in general, it's not easy to activate injunctive norms with messages, even though norms can have a strong impact on the decision to engage in a behavior according to your work. But in particular, it made me think that in order to make inductive norms work, it is more convenient from the perspective of, of a practitioner to communicate injunctive normative appeals in a subtle way. Thus, using messages that communicate injunctive normative appeals too explicitly can result in boomerang effects. In your research, have you thought about explicitness as an attribute that could moderate the effect of messages communicating norms, either injunctive or descriptive norms? And if so, what are your thoughts about regulating explicitness in messages with normative appeals? Should they be more or less explicit? Or that depends on the type of norm. Okay, I, 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 think, I think the key for this, for the people injunctive norms, is this notion of these norms are endowed relationships. 
Okay? They come because we have, I have a relationship with another person and they happen to believe in something. Okay? I think I can manipulate that. I mean, it's similar to the theory of an action. I mean, one of the things I was mentioning to Bob coming in is that I just reread Monty Fishbein, a retake on his theory. And one of the things he revised significantly, in my mind, was subjective non conformity. He was not very happy with it. And one of those motivations to comply. And so I'll give, I'll give you the absurd is of something like if you come to me and tell me, your wife wants you to use a condom. Are you telling me that my wife, I mean, I, I know my wife. Okay, how much credibility do you have with this? Okay, I think what we can do, which is a better approach, is to, uh, with some of the, the soap operas done, that are done in South Africa, is to put a scenario out there and expect parents, you know, partners to start talking about it and agree. But you cannot come from the outside and force a norm on a relationship that you're not part of. Okay? And I think that's the difficulty with quantum people with injecting norm. I don't think it can be done. Okay? Uh, regardless of the level of business. Okay? I think the issue is that it has to be part of a relationship and the definitely mm -hmm. negotiation will work better with it. Well then, to bring it to the latest news about the norms that are you know, observed or not, what you're saying is that no message about reporting child sexual abuse is going to be effective for a football team. It's very well. I think I think I think I think you you potentially running into. I mean, it's very strong norms. I mean, we I had a I had a student who ran a, ran a thesis, really interesting thesis, uh, on on injury. It's playing with injury, okay, with, with concussion, okay, and 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 he went to uh, some teams in the York area, okay, and and the Jets, and and we. Really, looked at this and, and it's clear that they feel an expectation to play injured even though it doesn't make any sense, okay? This is a very strong norm, it's a very binding group, particularly with the strong interdependence between the people and members, okay? And so, uh, uh, think about, I mean, some of the, some of the stuff we, uh, when I came here, Bob was doing domestic violence intervention, okay? And we're trying to get neighbors to get intervened. Again, it's very difficult to do that because it's a certain kind of norm that's built between the neighbors. And I'm coming from the outside, I'm introducing you, no man, and you just going to take it. Okay? It has to come, and I, I believe, again, my walk, my, a lot of my work now is in power in communities. I work with people in the community, trying to understand things from their perspective, and, and providing solutions that make sense to them, okay? not, not to me. Okay? And so I think that's part of that, part of this, to coming in and understand what is, what, is, what are you dealing with here right now? And can you change it or not? And, and who can change it? I mean, the coach can change that. The coach of the team can change that dynamic. Okay, so let's figure out what's my way in. Who's the kind of person who can help me change the norm? Who would have the credibility? Who would have a, a lot of people depending on this person? And and, and again, with them with to go with leaders in the community, I just want to point out that's a mistake. Because because leaders have absolutely no motivation to change the status quo. They have to benefit from it. Okay, and so the whole network studies is find people person on the margin. Okay, and introduce that. But I think. I think it's really crucial to understand it, the strength of it. Again, it's latitude. How much latitude do you have? You know, what I can do maybe is stretch latitude a little bit. But, uh, you know, again, like, like the theory says, social theory, if you try to give some position so far away from everybody, nobody's going to move in this direction. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's a key. It's baby steps. Let's take one more. You started off with this speaking example, um, and uh, it got me thinking about the difference between norms and laws. Um, because you could argue that while you're right that when you're driving down the highway, no one's following the speed limit, but there do seem to be norms about how fast you can drive and, and not drive, because especially with the definition of there being kind of a range. So um, what is the difference in your first of the three definitions where you, the first one being the rules. Is there a difference between a norm and a law? And is it necessary that the following of a rule is only to avoid sanctions as opposed to well, seeing it as a way of... Uh, I, 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 think, I think that would be a thing about a speeding example. Think about, so you know, I speed now, okay? but then I see a police car. Yeah. What do I do? I slow down. There's, there's a presence of enforcement. Sanctions now are real. Okay. So I'm not moving in this direction because I'm trying to avoid sanctions. Okay. So I can obey laws because I fundamentally accept them. In which case I don't have a problem. Okay. So I'm conforming to the norm 
in, in this case, because the norm is widely shared by everybody and it's formalized. Okay? But many of our laws are people, the things that people cannot accept. They don't accept them in practice, so I know the descriptive norm deviates. You see, everybody uh, uh, basically is speeding. So I know that the norm is not why we're going to speed with it. Okay? And another thing I notice is that when I talk about that, okay, so think about the, the, the part of the thing with public driving used to be that it was just a naughty thing to do. What's the big deal? Okay? And, and, and one of the things that was difficult for me with the stage was to find a sample of people who been asked about drug driving 20 years ago, it was in the 80s, and then zoom to the 2000s and, and have a sample of kids this age. For kids this age, drug driving is a big deal. Okay, it's a big no-no. Okay? Back then, the norm was different. Okay? Laws were there all the time. Just the question is, how much do you buy into the law? And I think that's part of the issue is that we very quick sometimes introduce something because we think it's good sense policy, okay? and then end up uh, 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 being a terrible idea that people tend to resist. Okay? Uh, give an example from I live in a small town, and, and, and uh, John Cozy at one point decided that it's not very efficient for small town to have their own education boards, and so we're going to cancel the education boards and merge with a bigger unit. Okay? And that was a bit of disastrous across New Jersey okay? because people, you know, you now have no representation on the board. Right? Because you know, there's only 500 people in the, the Rocky Hill, and there's uh, several thousands in Montgomery. Who's going to vote for me? And then we get representation. That's a problem. Okay? And, and so you, have, you haven't thought about it. So if you think about the people who think, see the logic behind the, the law, do they accept the norm? The answer is not. We resist it. We fought it really hard. Okay? And I think that's really crucial for policy. It's, uh, it's a great walk by Mark Schlesinger from Yale. And Mark talk about, and that's the guy I work with on the integration project. And the notion he has is not what he calls policy metaphors. Is that everything from obesity to presentable integration, people have stories in their head. I think that's another thing to remember. People have multiple stories. It's not that they have one story. They have multiple stories. And there's a queue that have them select one of these stories. Okay? And so a story about the present can be, these are bad apples. Nothing we can do can help. But genetically, there's a gen genetic mutation. They have to be in jail. Or, or killed, and all the other one of them for social responsibility. What it does very nicely shows how there's different sorts of attributions within and the different norms that comes with it. And if you can start moving people, you know, units, you know, to see something different by walking on this idea of norms, changing norms a little bit. That's what we try to do here. If you start thinking about a prisoner, not as an it's a policy implication. We're trying to get people to agree that a certain portion of the taxes will go to pay for reintegration. And we get a lot of resistance because the norm is not to help the prisoner. Okay? So how do we change that? We can change that by changing the story a little bit. Okay? We don't have a compelling story for, for speeding. We just don't. Okay? And I think that's that's uh, that's the issue. So as long as we think about it in terms of it's engineering, but you know, speeding is the cause, rather than mistakes or other things, people are not buy, buying into this and they continue speeding. Okay? So now we have a law that. I don't know how effective it is, but uh, uh, I'm not buying it. Thank you very much.